Okay, welcome everyone to Metagenomics Lesson 3. Today we're going to talk about uh, taxonomic classification again using an algorithm called MinHash. And then we'll run through a demo using a program called SourMash to do some MinHash uh, taxonomic classification on genomes and metagenomes. And we'll also run through a bit more about quality trimming using the BBDuke program in BBTools. And then uh, wrap it up with uh, testing another classification program called SendSketch, which is also in the BBTools. So one uh, task that we often like to do in genomics and metagenomics is compare two sets of DNA sequences for a variety of reasons. So for this example, let's assume that we have two genomes and we'd like to compare their gene content. Um, so in this case, a set is composed of a collection of genes in each genome. Say we have some identifiers for them. And the Jacquard similarity is a measure of the set similarity, which is given by the intersection of the sets divided by their union. So it's a quite simple um, uh, thing to calculate. <clears throat> In this case, we would count up the number of shared genes, those that are encoded by both genomes, and divide that by the total number of unique genes that both genomes collectively encode. So if genome A has 3,000 genes, let's say it's over here, and genome B also has 3,000 genes, and they share 1,000 genes, that's the intersection, then we can calculate the Jacquard index of genomes A and B as the intersection, so that's uh, the 1,000, and then the uh, union, which is uh, <clears throat> the number of genes that are unique to A, plus the number of genes that are unique to B, plus the number of genes that are present in both A and B. So it's important to remember that the union is not just the sum of the two genome sizes, but it's the, um, the set differences plus the, the union. So, so, plus the intersection. So overall, that would be 1,000 divided by 2,000 plus 2,000 plus 1,000, which would be one fifth. So our Jacquard index is 0 0.2. So we can uh, do that with genes or with uh, protein content or whatever we're interested in. Um, a lot of times we'll use k-mers. So in principle, we could break each of these genes up into its component k-mers. If we said, uh, say, k equals 21, we'd end up with maybe a couple million k-mers, unique k-mers for each genome. And then we could do the same computation where we take all of those k-mers, compare them against all the k-mers in the other genome, and then uh, estimate the Jacquard index from there. Um, whenever you do all versus all comparisons, you have to be really careful about what algorithm you're using to do the, that distance calculation because it scales up uh, with the square of the number of genomes you have. So if you're doing a thousand times a thousand, then you have a million um, um, sets to compare divided by two, so that's 500,000. If we were wanted to compare, say, all of the genomes in the NCBI genomes database, there's about 335,000 of those at the moment. So if we did an all versus all comparison, that would be about 56 billion comparisons. So if you can speed up each of those 56 billion comparisons by five or 10 uh, fold, then you'll make a real dent in the, the speed at which you can do a giant comparison like that. So one way to simplify this massive computational job is to approximate the Jacquard index instead of calculating it exactly. And that's what the MinHash algorithm does. So for a DNA sequence, the procedure would be like this. First, you extract all of the k-mers from a, a sequence of interest. Then you use some hash function to reproducibly convert those k-mers into numbers that are randomly distributed over some output range. Then you choose the numerically lowest hashes. Um, let's say the number is s. So you choose the numerically lowest s hashes which are also known as the min hashes, which gives this algorithm the name. And we'll call that the bottom sketch. And then we want to compare bottom sketches against each other using the Jacquard index. And the, the point here is that S is much, much lower than the total number of, of uh, signatures that you calculate. 
maybe 1,000 or something. Okay, so this has, hash function that's involved here um, can be a variety of things. Um, here's an example of a bad hash function um, where we would take a string of bases, say this one here, we would do some substitution, say substitute zero for A and T and one for C and G, and we get this number here. And then let's just truncate and take the first five digits and turn it into a decimal number. So that this number becomes, this letter, this string of DNA bases becomes the number 1000. Well, that's uh, technically a hash function because it maps some input range to a fixed output range. The maximum number here can be one, 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 one. So um, we have made a, a hash function, but it's not a very good one. This one will lead to a lot of collisions where many different sequences will end up with the same hash. And so that's not uh, a good property for a uh, hash function for this purpose. A good hash, hash function does have high compressibility, but it also has a high randomization, a uh, low collision rate, and a high speed. So the hash function that's typically used in <clears throat> bioinformatics al algorithms is called uh, murmur hash three. And it was actually um, invented by people at Google, I guess, who started using it to um, index web pages. And so it has a long history in uh, document comparison, comparing millions and millions of documents to each other. So the idea is that uh, with any hash function, an identical sequence hashed using the same function, and in this case, Kamer size, will produce the same hashes. So if you take one genome and run it through this, and another genome and run it through this algorithm, the same Kamers will end up in the same hashes. So using this um, algorithm here, which I'm not going to go into, suffice it to say that it's uh, fairly simple but um, and fast, but the way it does is that it breaks down the input into a number of different uh, chunks, and then it processes those chunks by, for example, multiplying by a constant, then doing a, a shift permutation in the number, multiplying by another constant, XORing with, the, uh, with some seed, doing another permutation, multiplying by another constant, adding a constant, and then doing that iteratively for each one. That ends up producing a nice random hash. It's quite computationally efficient and, uh, and it can be done very quickly. So if we take, for example, two strains of Schuonella Baltica and do this um, bottom sketching on both of them using this hash function, uh, this is what you get. So on the left, this is uh, one strain and on the right is another strain. The, simil the identical, um, Hash values are in blue and the unique ones for each are in um, black. And this is actual data. I just did this in Sour Mash a couple hours ago. So now the question is, what is the Jacquard index between these two strains? So to do that again, we take the number that is the intersection. So the number that's in both. So that's one, two, three, four blue ones and divide that by the number that are unique to A, which is six, plus the number that are unique to B, which is six, plus the number in the intersection, which is four, so that's six, 12, 16. So the Jacquard index is four over 16, or 0 0.25. Simple enough. Uh, so a couple of questions that might have come to you, because they came to me when I was reviewing this, were, for example, why not just take the lexicographically smallest s kmers and use that as a hash function? Well, the problem with that is that it's not a random selection, and you could have biases due to uh, GC content or unusual genes like transposons or something that are that are present and that may have a bunch of A's in them. And so um, that would also be bad for eukaryotes, which have all these poly A tails or uh, transcriptomics. So that's not a, a good... Um, algorithm because of those biases. And in fact, some implementations of minhash use a blacklist or other techniques to avoid artifacts like this, even, even in the case that, um, that we're using the, the hashing algorithm. Another question might be, why not just randomly select 
uh, s k-mers from each set and sort those lexicographically instead of calculating the hash on every single k-mer. And the reason that for that is not doing that is because it's uh, unlikely that two large sets will overlap with a small number of signatures s unless they're highly similar. So using the bottom sketch after sorting those ensures that an overlap will be found if it exists. Um, and that's why we want a fast, fast Hausch algorithm so we can, we can do all of them. Um, another question might be, how many signatures do you need to get a good approximation of the Jacquard index? And uh, that can be calculated using the, an expected error rate of one over the square root of S, the number of signatures. So uh, if, for example, you use 400 signatures, you have an expected error rate of about 0.05. Um, typically, programs will use an error, or not an error, but a, a signature number S of uh, thousands, probably. So the, the error rate should be quite low in those cases. So another way that um, some of these programs make the computation faster, and these are widely used across bioinformatics, actually, is a, a technique called a bloom filter. So this is named after a guy who invented this in the 70s, Burton Howard Bloom. And the main goal of a Bloom filter is to test whether an element is a part of a set. And it does this by trading a large memory footprint for speed. So um, it takes something that you could do uh, on the CPU and, and makes it so that it's easier to put into memory um, and compare things there. So tasks that are often used in metagenomics that uh, are helped with a Bloom filter are things like rejecting singletons or k-mers that contain errors. And we'll, we'll go through this and, and I'll show you how that works. So a Bloom filter is fairly simple. It's described by two parameters. The first one, m, is the length of the filter. So for example, we might take uh, two to the 31 bits, that's about two gigabytes or something, and initialize that array to all zeros. Then we have some number of hash functions n, which is much smaller than m, that each produce a hash in the range of the filter. So this hash will take in a um, kmer and output a hash in the range, or a number in the range of 1 to 2 to the 31 in this case. So uh, up on the upper right is an example of what this might look like. You have an array here of zeros and ones. Here we hash the number x using some hash function and it gives us uh, the number two, the number five, and the number 12, something like this. Then we hash y and it gives us some numbers in purple here or in red, and then we hash z and it gives us these purple numbers. And so the Bloom filter is built up by aggregating all of these all of these hashed values into one long, very long array. Uh, so to insert an element, you calculate the hash for each of your hash functions and insert them into this array by flipping the bit to one. If it's already one, then you leave it at one. And then whether you, when you want to go to test whether an element is part of a set, you calculate all of n hashes for your new element, for example, w, and then check the bits. If all of the bits are set, then you can say that maybe your, um, your element is part of the set. And you can adjust that maybe um, by changing the m and the n, which we'll get to in a minute. But you can never be definite because um, there will be the potential for a collision always. So you could always have uh, false positives, <clears throat> but you can never have a false negative because if at least one bit is unset when you check your new element, then you know that it's definitely not in, in the set because it, it would have been flipped when you uh, insert it. So in this case, W has this bit uh, one, it has a one here, but it has a zero here, which means that it has never been seen before. And so it is not in the set. Um, like I said, you can uh, change this false positive rate or change the rate, the, the likelihood that you'll get a maybe um, by 
by tuning the, the M and, and the N. In general, you want an M to be long enough that you don't start saturating the filter. If you do that, then you start losing, um, losing specificity. And you want to keep the number of hash functions fairly low to make it very fast to, uh, to run. So if we want to compare um, minhash, and I, and I should say some of these minhash programs that we'll use use a bloom filter to speed up the, the process. Uh, I forgot to mention that. Mostly they do it by uh, rejecting uh, singletons or rejecting erroneous k-mers. So what they'll do is that they will um, the first time they see a uh, kamer, they'll hash it and insert it into the bloom filter. And they'll only add it to the list of signatures if they see it again. So that prevents um, erroneous or single copy kamers from ending up in the signatures, which basically enriches it in things that are more common in the data set. Uh, you can also do a counting bloom filter where instead of uh, zero or one here, you would increment the value at each um, time you see the, uh, the hash. And that can be used to make, for example, a minimum number of elements of the served before you include them in your signature list. So um, several of the other programs use that technique. So if we want to compare minhash to uh, some other techniques for looking at the similarity between genomes, we can compare that to the average nucleotide identity, which is a method that's very often used to compare the similarity between the core parts of the genomes. So that's a technique where you, for example, take all the reciprocal best blast hits between two genomes, and then you compare the nucleotide identity between those RBHs, and uh, that gives you a, a similarity score called the ANI. So uh, in this 2016 paper by the authors of the program MASH, which implements MinHash uh, for bioinformatics, Andav et al. used uh, E. coli genomes to test the relationship between the uh, MinHash distance and the ANI distance. And you can see that these are all pretty much uh, linear. They have a nice regression coefficient. Um, if you increase S, the number of signatures, you can decrease that error. And um, you can also adjust it based on the kamer length. So shorter kamers will allow you to detect things that are farther apart distance-wise, uh, evolutionarily distance-wise. While if you increase the length of the kamer, then you start having fewer and fewer matches as you have uh, increasing phylogenetic distance. So the same principle applies for metagenomes. You can do a minhash on a metagenome. Uh, the figure on the right here is an example that I made. So I got a bunch of genome metagenomes from seawater in the Chukchi Sea, and I compared those to a bunch of metagenomes from the Terra Oceans database and some other metagenomes we have. And you can see uh, in colored dots on this heat map, we have the uh, Jacquard index. So uh, the brighter it is, the more similar the metagenomes are. So you can see my Chukchi C metagenomes cluster together, and these Terra Ocean genomes uh, cluster separately. So you can do that just to compare the, the data sets without any taxonomic classification at all. But a lot of the Programs are also set up so that you can compare them to a, a database, a taxonomically identified database similar to what we saw with Kraken, um, so that you can taxonomically identify the organisms that show up in your metagenomes. So SourMash, for example, has um, some databases that are built and available to download uh, to use in metagenome classification. One of them has 60,000 RefSeq microbial genomes in it. Another one has 100,000 GenBank microbial genomes. And then another one has 87,000 GenBank microbial genomes that are set up to uh, use in a least lowest common ancestor uh, analysis where you can get the um, intermediate nodes um, when you do your taxonomic classification. 
So here are some of the MinHash implementations that are out there that I know of. Uh, there might be others um, that you might find. Uh, I think these are pretty much the most popular. Uh, MASH was the original one, as far as I know. It's still uh, in use and it can use a Bloom filter to exclude singletons and it has some other methods for if you want to use um, some kind of min minimum number of, of kmers that go into your signatures. Um, MASH is also implemented online at the Patrick Similar Genome Finder. So you can upload your genome there and it'll run MASH on it and find the most similar genomes in Patrick and spit them out for you. Uh, Sour MASH is written by um, uh, Titus Brown's group and it also uses a Bloom filter with counting so you can choose a minimum Kmer count to include. It also uses a scaled S rather than a static S. So this takes into account the diversity of Kmers that you see and takes a proportion of those rather than an absolute number. Uh, it can generate some figures and we'll do that when we do the Sour Mesh demo. And it also has a, a tool to do a lowest common ancestor taxonomic classification. BB Sketch is a member of the BB Tools package it can also use a minimum Kmer count. It can also use a scaled S. Uh, it also includes some blacklists that block out um, hashes that are due to, for example, uh, Illumina adapters or things that are in the database that are wrong, stuff like that. Uh, it also does LCA taxonomic classification. And then there's one called Finch, which claims to be very fast compared to the other ones, although there's all pretty fast, so uh, speed isn't maybe the most important comparator here. Um, again, it uses a Bloom filter to, for the minimum Kmer count, and you can find it on GitHub. Okay, there's some resources, and we're gonna move on now to the demo where we're gonna try out Sour Mash, BB Duke, and Send Sketch in the binder environment. 